welcome everybody. It's great to see you guys and everyone over at Montrose. Thanks for gathering there. And uh, everybody online all over the place, uh, out at the Naval Academy, Caroline and friends, good to see you. And thanks for gathering there. And uh, up in Michigan, I was up in Michigan uh, this last week and there's people who gather there. And I just want you to know that we pray for you. Uh, you are foreigners in a foreign land. And I know coming back, I've taken like seven showers. I'm just like, ah, can't get the Michigan off of me. I was right near Ann Arbor. I was like, Lord, help. And so uh, it's just good to be home back here in God's country. Uh, but welcome, uh, welcome, welcome all of you as, as well. It's great to see you guys. Um, we've been in a, uh, a conversation here the last few weeks that we've just uh, been talking about being in a season of vision here at Grace Church. And I've been talking to you guys about how the opportunities God is putting in front of us has, uh, is outpacing our ability to keep up with it. And so we've been kind of having family conversations uh, around the family table talking about that. And uh, if you are our guest or if you are kind of new to the church, you've been invited to that table. We don't want anything from you, uh, but we would love to, for you to hear what God's doing and how we're trying to respond to it. Uh, but as, as all that's happening, I told you there's, there's a couple responses that we needed to make. Uh, we needed to raise uh, resources and relationships uh, to go after these things. And so I want to kind of report to you about this resource side. So uh, we really, one of the, the, the passion here at Grace is making Jesus make sense. And uh, one of the main ways the Bible tells, teaches us to do that is to start churches, to take uh, the church to places where the gospel is not clear, it's not easily accessible. So Grace does a ton of that. And, and we've started a bunch of churches and we wanna do that more and more. And so that takes everything from like leadership development, interns and residences and, and residents all the way to like the resources to send a bunch of us out to go start that church. So we've been talking about how those opportunities are like enormous and wonderful in front of us. I talked a lot about uh, the young adults, what God's doing in collective. Collective's more than doubled in the last year. Our student ministry's grown 40, 50% in the last year, children's ministries. Uh, and then we, we told you we really have this, this passion uh, to start a special needs ministry and, and to grow that and build that. And so those were the opportunities, some of them, not all of them, but some of them that I've been talking about. And I just said to you, if we're gonna go there, uh, we got to get resources around that, and then we got to get race, relationships around it. So our goal with the resources, uh, I said, what, what we need to do is we need a, a thousand households to get their shoulder under that. We don't have oil barons in Akron, Ohio. The tire barons are all with the Lord now, I guess. Like, they, they're not around. And so here in Akron, if we want to do something big, we all have to do it. And we all have to kind of get under it, so a 1,000 households. So I'm excited to let you know that the response to that is almost 1,100 households got behind. You didn't cheer for that, like behind that effort. And, it, and it's got under it and lifted it. So that is so encouraging. It's so encouraging that there's a unity within the family. It's so encouraging that your, your treasure is where your heart is and, uh, and God's locking you into that in a, in a, in a new way. Bunch of you uh, kind of jumped into that for the very first time, so thank you for doing that. And what's encouraging is what that means is we can press go on everything. So we're gonna press go, and, and we press and go on our interns and residents, uh, press and go on chasing these, these uh, uh, new church plants, we call them campuses, that we're excited about press and go on the, uh, the, the resources surrounding Collective and all the other ministries, and then press and go on starting uh, the, the uh, ministry to those who have special needs. And I, I emphasize starting a ton uh, because so many of you are interested in that, which I love, and you're passionate about it, which I love, and we're bringing that ministry kind of from scratch so it'll, it'll take a ramp, and we'll get to what we all envision, but it's gonna take a minute to get there. Uh, but press and go on the resources to make that move and just chasing this stuff down. So I always, I like to say that the secret sauce of Grace Church is that when God uh, gives us opportunities to make Jesus make sense, and it requires resources and relationships, the secret sauce of Grace is that the people of Grace always say yes to that. 
and you've done it again, <laughs> done it again. So we get to do this stuff, and it's so exciting about uh, how that's going to impact people's lives and how we're going to get to make Jesus make sense to folks who don't know him yet and how we get to keep sharing the love and the hope and, and sharing even in the needs that are around us. So thank you, thank you for that and excited about that. And these resources are being deployed immediately. Uh, so as we uh, like keep our commitments and those kind of things, that's in action and, and that's exciting. Now I also told you that when we talk about resources and relationships, I told you the hard part of this is the relationship part. Uh, so money is a challenge and you've met it. Sharing your life and ordering your life in such a way that you're actually engaging these relationships, that's always the harder part. And that's always the challenge of, 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 uh, of reaching folks and living the life that God has called us to live. And so that's what we've been talking about here these last couple of weeks. So um, we're, we're in this series right now that we call Who, What, When?, and what we're doing in this series is we're saying, okay, if I'm a Christ follower, how do I need to organize my life? Okay, so if, this is, if you're not a Christ follower yet, or like this whole thing is new to you, uh, this is the way that Jesus followers think. We would look and say, what I do is I have been changed by Jesus. I want to follow him. And what that means is, I want to understand his teachings. I want to look at his example. I want to see what he invested his life in. And then I want to mimic that into my own life. I want to become like Jesus. So I want to act like, talk like, think like, love like, and be motivated like Jesus. So to be a Christ follower, what I do is I take a, a hard look at who Jesus is and what he said and how he was. And then I order my life in the, in the same way. So what we've been doing is we've been looking at that and saying, well, what did Jesus do? Like, what was Jesus's like prime directive? What was like his mission and purpose in life? And Jesus sums that up really well in Luke chapter 19, where he says, the son of man, the son of man is another name for, of Jesus. So, what, so Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. And that was his prime directive. It's why he came to the planet, why he put skin on, to seek and to save those who are lost. So the way that Jesus sees the planet is he looks at humanity and when he sees humanity, he sees that we're lost. And he would say we're lost and we need to be found. And then when you read the Bible and you see how the Bible describes humanity, you'll see all that kind of language and metaphor around it. So Jesus will say humanity is lost. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, they're helpless. Uh, they're blinded. They're captive and they need to be set free. Uh, they're enslaved and the bonds of sin need to be broken. Uh, they're spiritually dead and they need to be raised to spiritual life. Uh, they need to be reborn. They need to be recreated. And what he's describing is he's like, he's describing people who are lost. People who have, have spiritual things wrong with them, so to say who need a solution and don't know what that solution is, Jesus would look and say, I am that solution. So I came to seek them and to save them because they, they can't save themselves because they're lost, because I love them. So if I'm a follower of Jesus, then I want to imitate that in my own life. So if you looked at me and said like, Jeff, what's your prime directive? I would be like, well, my prime directive is to become like Jesus and to love what he loved and do what he, do what he did. Well, what did he do? Because of who Jesus is, I seek those who are lost and I tell them of the salvation of Christ. I don't do the saving. I tell them of the one who can. And that's what we've been talking about, that that's who Christ is. That's how he would want us to think. It's how he'd want us to organize. It's the purpose of the church. The purpose of, God didn't give the church to the church. He gave the church to the world. And so the church is the, the physical representation of Christ on the planet. That's why you don't go to heaven the minute that you say yes to Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why we would give. That's why we would suffer. That's why we would share life. That's why we would bear one another's burdens. That's why we would do all that stuff. Because Jesus did that for us. We do that for one another and we love like he loved even our enemies the way that he loved them. So we're seeking 
to tell the salvation to those who are lost. Now, we just put that into a little catchy thing to remember, and we say we, we're called to live a who, what, when life. That's what we're looking to do. So we just define it who, who am I seeking to make Jesus make sense to? And as a Christ follower, I'm always asking that question. Who are the people in my life, and how can I help Jesus make sense to them? What does it take to reach them to do that? And then when is that going to occur on my schedule? And we've just been talking about this. So the last couple of weeks we talked about who. I talked about it. Then Pastor Joe talked about it. And this weekend, I want to open up the conversation of what. What does it take to reach them? What do I do in response to that? So we're going to kind of set up shop here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So if you've got a Bible, open it up there. 1 Corinthians 9. It's on the, uh, it's on the app if you want to use that. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is, is kind of talking a, around this idea of, of who, what, when is the way that I'll say it. And I want us to get the what part out of, of, out of what he was doing and what he led us to. So this is what he says, starting with verse 19. He says, even though I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the, the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow Jewish law, I too lived under Jewish law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did so that I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I don't don't ignore the law of God and I obey the law of Christ. When I was with those who are weak, I share in their weaknesses for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and to share in its blessings. And what Paul is saying is this. He's like, when when I'm around Jewish people, I try to make Jesus make sense into the Jewish culture. When, When I am around Gentiles, Gentiles are just everybody who's not a Jew. And so when I'm with Gentiles, I don't follow those Jewish laws. I kind of connect with their customs to make Jesus make sense to them. When I'm with those who are weak, I share in their weaknesses. I participate in that so I can make Jesus make sense. And then he uses this term, I try to find common ground. And I want to find common ground so that I can help Jesus to make sense to everyone that I encounter, right? So if we think about who... Who am I trying to make Jesus make sense to? And then what am I doing to do that? I want to give you three things that will help you with the what. And then if you're a Christ follower, these are the three things I think that Jesus would want us to do. If you're not a Christ follower, this will help Christians make sense. And like what we're doing and why we're doing it, why we're so weird. We're weird for a bunch of reasons, but this will clear up at least this particular one for you. And, and, and you'll be able to get your head around it a little bit, okay? So this idea of common ground. So what do I do? I'll steal Paul's phrase. The first thing that I do is I seek to find this common ground. And you see Paul do this all through this passage. So we'll just look at it again. I want you to see it. So he says, even though I'm a free man with no master... I have become, I'm, I'm becoming something, I'm going somewhere. I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, the common ground was I live like them. I live like the Jews to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, the common ground was I did that too. I lived under that law so that I could help them understand who Christ was. When I was with the Gentiles, I kind of lived under the Gentiles customs. I lived apart from the law and I found the common ground there so I could bring them to Christ. Then it's, it's interesting, he says, I didn't ignore what God said and I didn't disobey Jesus. Uh, it wasn't like a free for all, I was just connecting and tying in to them. When I was with those who are weak, I shared in their weakness because I tried to find that common ground, okay? So common ground, Common ground is any place I can meet my who and help make Jesus make sense to them. And the idea of common ground is that I go to them. I'm not asking them to come to me. So Paul looked and he's like, the Jews are are really tied in to like their culture and customs. I'll go to their culture and customs. I'm not asking them to 
come to me. The Gentiles think a different way. I'll go to them. I'm not asking them to come to me. I'm not entering into sin. I'm not ignoring who Christ is. But I'm going to go there as opposed to have them come here. Because I want to find that common ground with them. And I will go to that place of common ground. So what do I do to help Jesus make sense to my who? I go to them and I try to find common ground, okay? Now, I got to talk to those of us who are church people because I got to lean into something here for a minute. So if you're not a church person or if you're not a Jesus follower yet, then you're probably off the hook on this one. But I got to talk to some of us church people who grew up in church, okay? Because if you grew up in church, you grew up probably with a misconception about what it means to go to your who. And that misconception is actually not in the Bible. So if you grew up in church, the, the way that you grew up was this way, probably. The idea was, I invite you to come to me. So we called them outreach events. I invite you to come to an outreach event where you will hear about Jesus. Uh, we call them evangelistic events, if you're familiar with that term. I invite you to come to an evangelistic event. We even called them crusades, till so that got creepy. Like, I, I invite you to come to this crusade. And, and that's the way that we, if you grew up in church, it's probably the way that you were raised. You come to me, and if you come to me, then I'll make sure that you hear about Jesus. Paul is saying the opposite. He's saying you go to them. Why is he doing that? Ready? Because that proposition is not common ground. Ready? So for instance, the church is not common ground. A coming to church is a very, very unfair proposition. Uh, will you come to church with me? Uh, will you come to a building that you've never been in and to a mass of people that you've never met, that have traditions that you don't understand? We're singing, we're praying, we're standing, we're sitting, and we're doing something with babies, right? So we don't understand all this kind of stuff. And then you have to sit and listen to a guy. And he is witty and insightful and attractive, but you still have to sit and listen to the guy and he's going to tell you whatever he decided to tell you this week. And if you do all of that, then you can hear about Jesus. It's, it's a very unfair proposition. The church is not common ground. Ready? Ready? The Bible is not common ground. Right? If you want to know Christ, you should read the Bible. You should read a 2,000-page book to know Christ. So it's a book, kinda. I mean, there's a bunch of books in the book. What? Right, yeah, there's a bunch of books in the book. Well, how do you, where do you start? You start at the beginning? Oh, don't start at the beginning. Whatever you do, don't start at the beginning. Well, where do you start? Well, start about 80% of the way through it. That's, that's where you'll find Jesus. So Jesus isn't in 80% of the Bible. Oh no, he's in the first part too. He's just not called Jesus. What's his name? Well, you're not allowed to speak it. It's, it's, it's not common ground, right? It's confusing. And by the way, you need to learn two cultures, three languages, and understand how all that works together for it to really make sense. It's not common ground, ready? Christian living is not common ground. I wanna find Jesus. Uh, is there any Christian movies? Yeah. Should I watch it? Well, I mean, are they good? Eh. Right? What, what should I do? Should I, should I listen to Christian music? Yes, some of it. Not all of it? No, not all of it. Well, I listened to a song. What did it say? It said that I should be washed in the blood of the lamb, in the soul-cleansing blood of the lamb. Where are the babies? Right? <laughs> It's, it's a very unfair proposition. But if you were raised in church, you were taught to bring people to that. 
Okay, now we're gonna talk about the role of the church in a minute. Paul is not saying that, he's saying the opposite. He's saying, I went to where their life makes sense. I went to their place. I participated in their stuff. I didn't sin, I didn't ignore the law of Jesus, but I didn't ask them to overcome these hurdles to know Christ. I went to their common ground so that they could understand who Jesus is. So guys, this is something as simple as I eat lunch with my coworkers instead of read my Bible by myself. This is as simple as inviting friends over to the house to play pickleball, to video game in the dorm, whatever. It's, it's as simple as spending time with family, making that a point to go to their thing instead of your thing. It's as simple as joining other people's volunteer efforts. It's one of the biggest wonderful things you could do to find common ground. When you join someone else in what they believe in, I have a friend who volunteered at an animal shelter and I'm like, why are you doing that? Do you love animals? He's like, I hate animals. And I'm like, why are you doing that? He's like, I love my friend and they care about it. And I wanna be with my friend. And it may, that makes sense to them and then we get to talk and, and when he asks me about my life, I'm, I talk about Jesus. It's just going instead of asking people to come to you. Now, who is our example in this? Well, it's Jesus. The Bible says in John 1 that the word became flesh. The word is another name for Jesus. So Jesus put skin on and he made his home among us. He came to us. He came to the common ground. Why? So he would make sense to us. So it's through Jesus' humanity that we understand his teachings, that we understand his love, we understand his compassion, we understand his suffering, we understand his deity because I'm a human being and I can't raise myself from the grave. Because Jesus came to common ground. And so we who act like, talk like Jesus, we're motivated like Jesus in our limited way, we go and we find the common ground so that we can help make Jesus make sense there, right? So I find common ground. Now, once I'm at common ground, what do I do? When I'm at common ground, what I do is this. I speak the gospel clearly. I speak the gospel clearly. Now, what's the gospel? So I, I made my definition of the gospel and I pulled it from different sources and edited it into my own. So here is my attempt to nutshell the gospel for us to talk about. So here is the gospel. What's the good news of the gospel of Christ? The gospel is this. God sent his son Jesus to earth as a man so that through his life and death and resurrection, we could be rescued from sin receive forgiveness and embrace the abundant life that we have been created to enjoy. So as a Christ follower, I'm going to speak that. And I'm gonna look at you and I'm gonna look at the people around me and I'm gonna say, Jesus saw us as lost. So I wanna see everyone through his lenses, we're lost. How am I lost? Well, my life is tainted and diseased by sin. Sin is everything that's wrong. All the wrong that has been done to me and all the wrong that I have done. And my sin makes me imperfect and it separates me from God because he is perfect. And perfection and imperfection cannot coexist with each other. So sin separates me from God, but I got good news. I got a gospel. The good news is that God sent his son, Jesus, and Jesus came and through his life and his death and his resurrection paid for my sin. So when I receive the forgiveness of my sin, Jesus covers me so when I go to interact with God, I don't do that through Jeff, I do that through Jesus. Jesus traded his perfection for my sin. 
and I receive then the covering of his perfection. That allows me to receive salvation and it also allows me to enter into this abundant life, this different life, this life that I was created to enjoy. So when I'm at that common ground, I speak that and I speak it clearly. And this is what motivated Paul to be on that common ground. When he was there, he was telling this story or this good news of Jesus and you see it. I'm a free man, I became a slave, why? To bring many to Christ. I live like a Jew, that's the common ground, why? To bring the Jews to Christ. When I lived under Jewish law, that was the common ground. Why did you do that? I did this so that I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. I live like the Gentiles, that was the common ground. Why? So that I could bring them to Christ. I, I, I shared in the weaknesses of the weak, why? Because I wanted to bring them to Christ. I try to find this common ground. In fact, I do everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news or the gospel of Jesus. And when I'm on that common ground, I am speaking that gospel and I am speaking it clearly, okay? Now, I want, if you're not a Christ follower yet, I, I wanna talk to you for a second, okay? Because I think this will help make Christians make sense. The reason that I speak that clearly is because I believe that because I was a sinner, I was going to lose my eternal soul. And in my understanding of what Jesus taught, if I don't ask him for the forgiveness of my sin, my soul will be lost forever in hell and my life will never be on earth, will never be what it was actually meant to be. Now I, this is Jeff now, I didn't know that. I knew, I knew that God was gonna judge people one day and that God really didn't like the way I was behaving. I knew that. I never knew he loved me so much that he gave his own life for me. Nobody ever told me God loved me. I found that out when I was a junior in college because my friend, Steve Huber, told me that. He said that to me. And then he showed that to me. I didn't know that. And when he told me that, I was like, I am lost. And I actually don't know what to do about that. And Steve said, Jesus will forgive you if you ask him and you can have salvation, and you can have this other life. You can enter into it. I didn't know that existed. So he told me that. He did not say, if you don't accept it, I'm not gonna be your friend anymore. He never threatened me that way. He just told me that good news, and I received that good news. And I was like, I wanna follow Jesus. So I started following Jesus when I was junior in college. And in my mind, as a Christ follower, that was a life and death decision spiritually, right? Now ready? Because I believe that was a life and death decision spiritually, if I look at you and I love you and I never say anything about this, so if I believe you're in the same life and death dilemma that I was in, but I don't tell you in my mind, that is the most unloving thing I could possibly do to you. So as my friend, as somebody that I love, I have to tell you that. I'm not putting our friendship on the line saying you do it my way or we're not friends anymore. But I also can't be quiet because I actually believe that your soul's at stake. I have to tell you those things, right? Now, ready? I gotta talk to the church people again. I gotta talk to the church people again, okay? Here's the deal. If you grew up in church, 
you probably heard or learned or were taught something that's not in the Bible. So you probably heard or learned or were taught this idea that I'm going to accept Christ and I'm going to live at such a level as someone who accepted Christ that when other people see me, they'll want to accept Christ too. There was a term for it. It was called lifestyle evangelism. And I'm going to live in such a way that when you see me, you're going to want to accept Christ. That concept is not in the Bible. That's not what those verses mean. I was talking to a friend about this yesterday. And he, I, was, I said, hey, I said, how are, you, how are you telling the people in your life about Jesus, the people that you love? He's telling me how much he loves his neighbor. And I was like, oh, if you tell him about Jesus, how's that going? He's like, oh, I haven't said anything. I said, oh, well, how are you going to tell him? He goes, well, here's my thinking. My thinking is that when they see me back out of the driveway every week and go to church, they'll think to themselves, wow. <laughs> and I was like, that's the plan. He goes, he goes, yeah, that's the plan. I said, okay, let's talk about the plan. First of all, how creepy are your neighbors that they're watching you back out of the driveway all the time? Like everything about that says stalker and get a restraining order involved. Secondly, how do they know where you're going and third, how do they know why you're going there? So they, they have to see you do that every week. And then they have to know where you're going. And then they have to know why you're going there. That doesn't make any sense to me. You will not find that in the Bible. What you will find in the Bible is you will find the proclamation of the gospel. Proclamation is this, right? I'm gonna proclaim, proclamation looks like this. You're not gonna believe what I just found out. You are, you're not gonna believe what I just found out. That's a proclamation. So you'll find proclamation in the Bible. You're not gonna believe this. I was blind and now I can see, right? That's a proclamation. You'll see that in the Bible. You'll see preaching the gospel in the Bible. So when there was a guy, Stephen, he was martyred because of his faith in Jesus. As he was being martyred, he preached a sermon. Uh, there was a guy named Peter. He was in front of like these rulers. They want to know what was going on. He preached them a sermon starting with creation all the way to the resurrection of Jesus. There's a guy named Paul. Uh, he was in front of the Roman government. He preached a sermon you'll, about the gospel. You'll, you'll hear preaching and then you will hear the telling of the gospel. So Jesus one time went and he, he met this lady at the well and, and uh, she had all these needs and he knew it and he's like, what's going on? And she's like, I'm really thirsty. And he's like, uh, I know about a living water. And she's like, who's that? He's like, this guy right here, right? So he would tell, you never saw people coming to Jesus out of mass observation you saw their claims of Jesus being legitimized through the love of their life. But this idea of lifestyle evangelism, that doesn't exist. It's the speaking or the telling of the gospel. And, and if you're not a Christ follower, I have to do that or I feel like I don't love you. This is what, if, you're, if I'm a Christ follower, imagine it this way, I'm in a house that's on fire our lives are in danger. I'm being blinded by the smoke. So my, my life is in danger. I'm blinded. I'm trapped. I'm, I'm captured by it. As a Christ follower, if I find my way out of the house, is the appropriate response to the people in the house is still on fire for me to stand in the front yard as an example of someone who can escape? Is the appropriate response for me to stand in the front yard and comment about how horrible it must be to still be trapped? Oh, I bet it's getting miserable in there now. Would the appropriate response be for me to judge the people who are trapped? <laughs> they can't even find their way out. Or would the appropriate response be for me to open my mouth, to proclaim, I found the way out. 
to tell. If you go to your left and go to your right and then, or to enter the common ground of the house on fire so that they can know how to escape also. If I love you, what would I do? And why would I do that? See. So when I have who, I'm trying to figure out what, I start with a common ground, and then I clearly speak the gospel. This is what Paul says back in Romans. How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him unless they've, if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And it's the personal telling. It's the personal telling that cuts through all the noise about Jesus on social media. It's the personal telling that cuts through all the pollution of Jesus politically. It's the personal telling that cuts through all of the, the tragic and ungodly things that have been done in Jesus' name. Because when I love you and I'm telling you what God has done for me, you're not thinking about these things. And if I have found what I believe is a path to life, if I love you, see, I don't have an agenda, I'm not trying to make the church bigger, I'm not trying to win politics. If I love you and I believe your soul's in danger, I find that common ground, I clearly speak the gospel, and then the last thing I would do is I would invite them to be around the church family. All right, so let's talk about this for a second because it's interesting. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, God's purpose is to use the church to display his wisdom. The church is, the spiritual, is a spiritual entity and we are the physical representations of Jesus on the planet. That's why you don't go to heaven the minute that you accept Christ. So we represent Christ or we're a ambassador to Christ as if Jesus himself were making his appeal through us. So when I connect with my who on the common ground and I'm speaking the gospel, one of the most helpful things I can do is invite them then into my web of relationships that might be in a church building, it probably won't be at first. And I'm inviting them into my web of life-giving relationships. Why? Because the gospel makes the most sense when it's experienced within the context of a spiritual family. When Jesus' people are compassionate to me, I start to understand the compassion that Jesus is offering to me. When Jesus' people are forgiving to me, I start to understand the forgiveness that Jesus is offering to me. Why? Because we're his ambassadors as if Christ himself were making his appeal through us. When Jesus' people accept me, they love me even though I don't agree with them and I don't want to do the things that they want me to do. But they love me anyways. I start to understand how Jesus has loved me. When Jesus' people enter my common ground, I start to understand how Christ entered my common ground. And when I hear the gospel and experience it and feel it and see it, that's when it starts to make more sense. And it opens the conversation up to understand it more deeply. Pastor Josiah said it this way. He said, when you get someone in a spiritual environment, you open the floodgates of spiritual conversations. Talking about a sermon or the Bible is a wide open door. At church, a person gets to hear more about Jesus in one weekend than over two weeks of, of, of uh, water cooler talk. We fight for 15 minutes of spiritual conversations at work or in the dorm, but the church opens the dorm to hours of spiritual conversations. I'm just inviting people into the spiritual entity of the church. Sometimes that's the physical realm of the church. So sometimes I'm inviting 
them to service, to weekend services or merge or collective or power kids or whatever. Sometimes it's a Bible study, but it's at their common ground. Sometimes it's your life group. Sometimes it's a web of friendships and just a connection where lonely people can have their aloneness alleviated. But when I experience the gospel, as I hear the gospel, it clarifies the gospel. And as Jesus' people love as Jesus loved and forgive as Jesus forgived and speak truth as Jesus spoke truth, see, the gospel makes sense. And the reason that I find that common ground is so that I can clearly speak that I want to make Jesus make sense to those who are around me, okay? Now, all of this leads to a difficult truth, a difficult truth, okay? And if you're not a Jesus follower yet, you're totally off the hook on what I'm about ready to say. If you are a Jesus follower, you need to remember that I love you because I'm gonna tell you a difficult truth. Ready, here's difficult truth. Who with no what is unloving? Who, with no what, is unloving? In fact, who, with no what, is almost hateful? Because if I believe that I'm in the burning house, and my eternal soul is at stake. And if you have accepted Christ, you have come to that conclusion. I need rescued, I need saved, I need to see because I'm blind. I need reborn because I'm spiritually dead. I need to leave the old and have the new. You have come to that conclusion. And if I have come to that conclusion, and I look at other people who are lost by Jesus' definition, they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They don't know how to get out of the house. And my response to that emergency is passivity. It's, it's more than unloving. Because I actually know the way, the truth, and the life. And having no agenda, no ulterior motive, nothing beyond I was lost and I have been found by God and I believe that your soul was in the same danger as mine. Who, without what, what, what do I do about that? And a passive response is an unloving response. Right? Now you got on your chairs these cards. We've been handing these out. Grab these real quick. You will never hand these in and they will never be displayed publicly. That's not what these are. They're just a little tool for us to actually put, put feet to this whole thing. So on the front, we've been showing you who, what, when. Just to, I just want you, to, I want you to think who, what, when, see who, what, when, live a who, what, when lifestyle, okay? So on the front, who, what, when. On the back, we put a new thing on there for the next couple of weeks for you to think about specifically this what. And I just want you to start to organize in your mind. Jesus did this all the time. He was organizational and strategic. So when Jesus went and talked to that lady at the well, he went 40 miles out of his way to have one conversation. So he did stuff on purpose. So I want you to think about this on purpose. So I'm thinking about who's my who, and then what's my what? Like what are our common ground? Is it interest? Is it locations? And you could put more categories. These are just examples, right? So I was talking to a couple people about this. They're like, I have a who, I'm not sure what to do. 
And my one friend said, my, my, my who loves sports? And I said, oh, we have, we have uh, men's basketball leagues. We have golf leagues. We have fitness classes. We, I'm like, what if you did that? And they were like, I have to exercise. I'm like, well, it's for the Lord. And so I said, why don't you do that? You get connected. And after you have a game, go out and get coffee, have a beer, do whatever you're going to do and, and hang out and talk with them. And that's a what? That's a plan. Like, that's a, that's, a, that's a great idea. I was like, I know, that's why I said that, right? So who, what, interest. Another guy was like, I have a who, they have a what, and he said to me, he goes, they're so into Marvel. Like, they have Marvel tattoos. He's like, they're so into the Marvel universe. I don't know how to share Jesus. And I said, watch Endgame with them. Watch Endgame. They're like, what, I don't understand. I was like, watch it. Thanos is Satan, Iron Man's Jesus, boom, gospel. Like, there you go, right? So I'm like, you're, you're just, you're just go, go, go into this world, it's their world, and find that out. And you, you come up with your own stuff. We're just giving you examples to think through. I, I have a who, I'm not sure what. Well, a what is, I, we, I, we work together. So we, we can lunch together, we go to school together, they're family, we can get together. They're, they're uh, you know, we're on the same team. And we can, we can study together. We can, you just pick your what. But what, what I want you to think about, and this is 100% for you, okay? You, you never hand these in. Who is that person? And then can I start to put a plan together? Because I see that they're in the house. And I gotta think to myself, like, how do I get them out or how do I get back in to lead them out? And I'm just putting a little feet to that and starting to think it through. Why? Because a who without a what is unloving. And if I believe that your soul is in danger and I believe that I was rescued from the exact same place that you are, what am I going to do to address that and to start working through it, okay? All right. The band's gonna come out and we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna pray for us and we're gonna sing two songs. The first one is a prayer. It's called So Will I. And uh, maybe as they sing it, you can sing it. It's a commitment to God. And it's a commitment to God that you'll act on his heart in the same way that he did to them, okay? So would you just bow your heads and let's pray. And Jesus, we just want to so to say, invite you personally into this moment. Lord, would you interact with us individually? And would you, would you help us to see in our hearts places that maybe we're passive, maybe we're callous? God, would you help us to, through your spirit to bring clarity and wisdom? Maybe we're confused or afraid or uncertain, insecure. And God, would you just kind of meet us in a very personal way in that place? And Jesus, would you start to help us remember what you've done for us and let your love for us compel us to love others around us in that way? Jesus, I also pray for the one who has not received your forgiveness yet. Guys, that might be you. Maybe, maybe you're like me and nobody's ever told you. I, di I didn't know. I didn't know. I wasn't hard-hearted. I wasn't a jerk. I just, nobody said. They told me to be religious and to be a good boy. Nobody explained to me who God was and what he did for me. And maybe this weekend you're hearing that for the first time and and you're ready to say yes to Jesus like I was when Steve told me. So I encourage you to do that. And that is a prayer from your heart to God's heart. It does not matter what you say. God knows your heart. But if you're looking at him and saying, Jesus, I choose to believe what you say about yourself, that you're the only way of salvation. I'm lost. I admit it. And I'm asking for your forgiveness. And I'm saying that I'll follow you. I'm not saying that I'll come to church. I'm saying I'll follow you. And I, I know I don't know what I'm getting myself into, but I know I need to get myself out of. 
And so I want to know you. I want to receive your salvation. I want to follow you. If you pray that or your version of it to Christ, he will save you and he will forgive you. And his people will love you and will do our best to show you how to love and obey and follow him. So Jesus, in this moment, would you personally connect with the one who is feeling drawn by your kindness and love. Jesus, as a church, would you give us this heart? Would you give us this focus? And would you let us be people who reflect your passion and love? 